All right, so we have a wonderful uh, ceremony ahead of us with a tradition now in its 12th year of having a student as our keynote speaker. As in past years, we conducted a nationwide search and screened so many highly qualified students ranging in age from high school seniors to graduate students, all of whom share their intent to pursue a career in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. After an extensive search, reviewing the largest number of applicants ever received in recent years, 136, we are pleased to have with us this evening the 2024 keynote scholarship recipient, Ms. Abigail Frank. Now the club is providing Abigail with a $15,000 scholarship to support her academic pursuits. <laughs> Abigail is a native of Portland, Oregon, and she joins us from Purdue University where she studies aeronautical and astronautical engineering as a sophomore. I encourage everyone to read her entire list of impressive achievements within our program but let me just take a moment to name a few. Abigail leads the Purdue Space Program's high altitude team and is an active participant of the, pro of the program Leading Women Toward Space Careers. And through a National Science Foundation funded program in Kenya last summer, Abigail's work on educational policy earned her awards from the university and honors college. And because apparently she still had some free time, Abigail was also a member of the US Junior Olympics rhythmic gymnastics team and, by the way, is a three-time equestrian national champion in addition to being Oregon's Horsewoman of the Year. Abigail aspires to earn a PhD to contribute to the frontiers of space exploration. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the podium tonight's 2024 keynote speaker, Ms. Abigail Frank. If you've ever experienced sibling rivalry, you might relate to this story. When my little sister was three, she announced that she was going to be an airline pilot. My mom found a toddler-sized tuxedo at Goodwill and sewed stars on the collar and stripes on the sleeves, just like a real pilot's uniform. My sister wore that pilot's outfit every time we went to the airport. Do you know what happens when you show up to the airport looking like this? Well, I'll tell you, they roll out the red carpet saying, right this way and would you like to meet the pilot? Forget first class, forget platinum medallion status. Not even Southwest boarding position A1 will get you the kind of VIP treatment that this will. I rode my sister's coattails to all those visits to the flight deck. I stood off to the side while she sat in the captain's seat. She even wrote thank you notes. I didn't join in because I was tall and lanky and looked much older than I was. Let me warn you, there is an age at which showing up to the airport wearing a fraudulent uniform impersonating a pilot <laughs> leads to a very different kind of special treatment. I didn't even like airplanes. Airplanes were my sister's thing. But as I watched the crew fawn over her, I certainly felt that seething jealousy that only a sibling can evoke. She eventually outgrew both the tuxedo and her aviation fixation. So how did I take over as the family's aerospace enthusiast? It goes all the way back to 2014. I was an earnest 11-year-old with braces, pigtails, and an obsession with horses. 
I was still asking Santa every Christmas for my very own pony. A wise Santa at the mall once told me that he has a strict no live animals policy, but I still held out hope. That summer, my grandparents took my family to a dude ranch in Wyoming. We had a fabulous time riding horses through the glorious wide open spaces and enjoying soaring views of the mountains. But something else happened that week, something unexpected. After a leisurely evening of laughter and conversation with the family, my sister and I tumbled out into the clearing in front of our cabin. We were in search of the ranch's resident kitten, a rambunctious tuxedoed firecracker named Mittens. As we lay in the grass petting the kitten, I became transfixed by the sky. The town was a tiny speck on the map, and the night sky was a completely different creature than back in my suburban Oregon yard. There were more stars than I'd ever seen, and it had depth and color, and it almost felt alive. There were splashes of pale white and streaks of gray and murky black and even purple. And there were bright stars and dim stars and twinkling stars. And if I stared at a single point for a while, more points of light appeared around it. I lay in the grass, mouth agape, a living definition of awestruck. Something had awakened in me. The following winter, my family visited Big Bend National Park in Texas. It turns out to be one of the best places in the country for stargazing, and the cabin we rented was in the middle of nowhere. It was so quiet. There were no houses, no cars, no people, for as far as we could see or hear. The cabin had its very own telescope, and we figured out how to get it working. My dad started pushing all the buttons, and my mom read the manual. Wow, the stars and planets and galaxies we could see. Our gasps and our oohs and our ahs mixed with the crickets as the only sounds punctuating the night. Dad mostly spent time tinkering with the telescope's controls, so I lay on my back in the cool night air and stared up at that extraordinary sky. It felt like my whole body was quivering. That awakening was back, that thrill of the vast expanse above me. My mom and I talked about how, not that long ago, people believed that the sky was like a blanket, a dome of pinpricks draped over us. We tried to imagine telling them that space is more vast than we can even fathom, and that someone has actually walked on that flaxen sliver up there. My mom said, Abby, in your lifetime, humans will walk on Mars. I remember lying there, completely still, imagining. What if? What if I could be part of that somehow? In the months that followed, my mind started percolating on how I could make this happen. I looked into whether NASA will hire 12-year-olds who are currently taking Algebra 1. <laughs> they won't. But as you all know, they do have programs for high school students. So when the time came, I applied to be a NASA aerospace scholar. My cohort got to design a mission to Mars. I came home that first day and excitedly told my mom, I have found my people. <laughs> From there, I was off and running. I interviewed a spacesuit designer about her work. I became obsessed with how a tiny change to the construction of a spacesuit glove could have a huge impact on the thermoregulatory function of the entire spacesuit. I brazenly logged into the Zoom office hours of an aerospace engineering professor at CU Boulder, even though, one, I was not one of her students, two, I was not enrolled at that university, <laughs> and three, I was a junior in high school. She graciously talked to me for an hour. I interviewed a scientist who lived in a simulated spacecraft at Johnson Space Center for a month-long habitat test. She patiently answered my endless questions and offered her personal cell phone number if I ever wanted to know more. These professionals were generous with their time, curious about my interests, and giving of their knowledge and expertise. They all said, this is hard, but you can do it. 
I scoured the course catalogs at various universities and pored over descriptions of advanced aerospace classes that sounded so difficult, sometimes I didn't even understand the title of the class. I watched October Sky and The Right Stuff and Top Gun. Let's be honest, I watched Top Gun a couple of times. <laughs> Fast forward a couple of years, and now I can do math problems that don't have any numbers in them at all. <laughs> I called my parents last year and excitedly blurted, I know how to calculate an orbit. Thermodynamics is legendary at Purdue, and the homework is grueling, but it barely feels like work, and I'm learning real stuff about rockets. Sometimes I have to pinch myself because I'm actually living my dream. As a wide-eyed college freshman sitting in rocketry team meetings, sometimes I didn't understand the words flying back and forth. Now, I lead those meetings. I recently took over leadership of a large rocketry team, and just two weeks ago, we launched a rocket that we've been working on for over a year. I was planning to come here and tell you about how perfect our launch was. <laughs> And it was until five seconds into flight. <laughs> when our airframe experienced a catastrophic structural failure. We stood in stunned silence, watching as pieces of our rocket fell to the Kansas farmland. The disappointment pierced me to my core. Then someone from avionics shouted, we still have a signal. And the entire team, every single person, spent the next two hours scouring several square miles of farmland. We found every piece of our broken rocket. The metal pieces were mangled. The threaded rods sheared clear in half. The Kevlar shock cord had shredded our airframe in two, and the fins were stripped clean off the body. But the payload survived. <laughs> the biologists are thrilled that their experiment worked. <laughs> and avionics survived, and we've recovered insane data and the camera survived, and the footage is thrilling. <laughs> we rallied that day, and at the team dinner, everyone was talking and laughing, and I don't know if I've ever seen our team have that much fun or bond so beautifully. Some people are describing this launch as a complete failure, but we learned so much more about rocketry and about teamwork than we would have if our launch had been perfect. We supported each other, and we figured out what happened. Our rocket came apart, but our team came together. <laughs> our team even trying this work would not be possible without your groundbreaking research, bold testing, and the generous mentorship that all of you have given to students like me. I'm in awe of the knowledge contained in this room and I hope to someday be a small part of this incredible bank of expertise. Since I'm sure you all are wondering, my little sister is almost all grown up now. Despite our brief rivalry over the attention of flight crews, she is my closest confidant and my best friend. I'm thrilled that she and my parents are here with me tonight. I am so grateful and humbled to be here. I want to extend my deepest gratitude to the National Space Club for funding this scholarship. This has been the most incredible experience. And to all of you, thank you for your leadership, your innovation, and your willingness to invest in the scientists and engineers of the future. I am beyond excited to see what that future will bring. Thank you.
Thank you. <laughs> Hammer down. <laughs> Thank you, Abigail. That was great. Your family must be incredibly proud and your sister incredibly gracious to allow that photo to be shared with 2,000 strangers. <laughs> we all look forward to seeing you continue to thrive in your studies and to having you join our ranks. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we had so many remarkable students apply for this year's keynote speaker award. Last year, because of our industry's tremendous generosity, we began to recognize the runner-up for the top student award. This year, that, that honor goes to Second Lieutenant William Kirby, United States Space Force. <laughs> Lieutenant Kirby, is a space operations officer in the US Space Force and a first year graduate student studying space systems engineering at John Hopkins University. The club is providing Will with a $5,000 scholarship to support his academic pursuits. Ladies and gentlemen, Second Lieutenant William Kirby.